church Bible study, Wednesday night Bible study. It's exciting to be here. Um, we, we got together last, last week in the parking lot. I'm looking forward to doing that again. We're also talking about maybe doing another drive-by in the next little bit and go by and visit some of our shut-ins on Wednesday night or maybe a Sunday afternoon. That's going to be exciting. Just trying to keep the community together and as tight as, as we can um, during this time of COVID that has been an absolute change for all of us. Can somebody say amen? amen. But aren't you glad you're alive and well and here? and able to be in a gathering this evening. Isn't it good? Um, well, this evening we're going to be in James chapter 4, verses 11 and 12, and we're going to talk about slander. Yeah, you wish you'd have stayed home now, right? <laughs> so so let's, let's, take a, let's take a look at, at the way we're studying James. Um, as we progress in James, we've been keeping verse, chapter 1, verse 4 in mind. It says, let, no, let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. So James has written this book, so that Christian believers, and they were Jewish by genetics, and they had been driven out of their homes, he was reminding them that we need, no matter our situation, we need to mature in Christ. No matter what struggles we have, no matter what has befallen us, we need to grow and mature in Christ. So he's got some pretty strong words. Basically, he's saying um, to grow up. And so he's written to Jewish believers, and this is, this is James, the half-brother of Christ, and he tells them at one point, he says, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves, but be a doer of what the word says. So it's producing something. So, so the word of God should come into our life and it should produce an effect. We should produce something, kind of like a poet that writes a poem or, or those kind of things. So that's the purpose of the word of God. It should produce a changed nature in us. So we're walking with Christ. We've been born again. We've been redeemed. And as we grow... In a process called sanctification, we, we, we learn how to work according to our new faith. Now, you all have probably met people that are stagnant in their faith. They, they uh, maybe walked, I, I use this illustration all the time, maybe they walked an aisle during VBS and, and, and then they haven't really had much producing of faith. And a lot of it has to do with discipleship. That's why I like to focus on discipleship. Growing in the faith, understanding and working it out in your life. So we're going to be in, in, in chapter 4. And he talks about this in verse 25, and I'm going to mention it again because we're going to get to this again this evening. It says, but whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. So there's a blessing entailed in following the law, the, the law of liberty, that we have the royal law that James actually brings up a little bit later on in the book, which is uh, to love God, love your neighbor as yourself, which is the same thing Jesus said contains the whole of the law. When he was walking, he said, listen, you know, the, the sum of the Ten Commandments was this, which is actually the sum of the entire 613 laws, which is the sum exactly of the Old Testament, is love God and love your neighbor as yourself. So you can see how there's a flow that goes with the teaching. Now, remember, James would have heard a lot of this firsthand from his older half-brother. Uh, so tonight, um, we're going to be talking about speaking slanderously about others. And so it's just two verses Something James throws in at the end of the pericope that we've been studying, he kind of throws this in before he begins to address them about specific things. He tags this on the end of something that's already going on. It's important because one of the things he talks about in the verses that we've been studying is uh, what's, it's the Greek word diabolos, which is um, the slanderer, also translated as the devil or the Satan. So if you go back in the Old Testament where the Satan is mentioned, if it's been translated into Greek, they use the same word, diabolos. And so we have an idea that one of the means of operations of the devil is slander. One of the things that we see in Hebrews, later on in Hebrews, I think it's Hebrews 13, it says, uh, don't let a bitter root grow up. And, and many people fall under that. You know, one of the things Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7 was, don't judge others. And that's a, that's a tricky verse. If you're into apologetics and you're into defending your faith, one of the things you run into when you're talking to non-believers, is if, if you have any feelings whatsoever about the, what, thing, what things the Bible calls sin, is, is they're going to come right back as soon as they can with don't judge others. Judge not lest they be judged. Remember Jesus said that. And then he talks about in the judgment that you use, the same force of judgment will be placed back on you. And, and there's a lot of different ways to look at that, about what that means. Um, if you've ever judged anybody and you've been judged back by that person, they usually come back and hit you as hard as you hit them, don't they? So that's kind of the picture that's being painted there of Christ. So let's talk about what it says. So starting with verse 6, he says, But he gives us more grace. That's why the scripture says, God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. So you see there's a, 
there's a, a line in here. It's, it's about being humbled. And, the, and we know it's going to say here in a moment that God, you know, if we humble ourselves before the Lord, he's going to lift us up. So humility is kind of the crux of this section of scripture. Verse 7 says, Submit yourselves therefore then to God. Resist the devil, the diabolos, and he will flee from you. Come near to God and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. So he's talking about, you know, drawing nigh to God. And, you know, a lot of people talk about God seems so far from me. And, and a lot of people even think maybe that God has abandoned them. And that's not the case whatsoever. If anybody has moved in the situation, it's us. But if we resist the devil and the temptations that come into our life, and, and, and in the, the crux of all this, that would be pride, um, an arrogant attitude, or thinking of ourselves more highly than we should, forgetting that we are sinners, the Bible says, and we've been redeemed from that sinful state through the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He came to do that. And so we forget sometimes, and, and we, can, we can get a, easily get an elitist mentality about what it means to be um, born again or a part of the church. And, and, and then sometimes you can catch church people kind of looking around at other people and one of the complaints that I had working out in the world at times was that people didn't want anything to do with Christianity because they'd been around some Christians. Now, a lot of times they overinterpreted something that a Christian said. Um, if, if a Christian, let's say, is, is against abortion and they make a stand against abortion, well, then they get offended because they may be pro-abortion, so immediately they think you're against them. And, and, and so a lot of things get construed differently. Um, Verse 9 says, grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourself before the Lord and he will lift you up. And so what James is teaching them is, is this is a struggling church. This is a group of people that I, I believe has, word is coming back to James that, that, first of all, they're maybe not treating each other well. They're in a strange situation. They're in a strange land. Bad things have been done to them. They've lost their place. They found a place to live. And they're not fitting in well with the community around them. And so there's a lot of complaining, a lot of griping, a lot of murmuring. And, and this is one of the things that James is telling them to grow up about. Verse 11 says, brothers and sisters, do not slander one another. Anyone who, who speaks against a brother or sister or judges them speaks against the law and judges it. When you judge the law, you're not keeping it, but you're sitting in judgment on it. Remember what he said earlier? He said, be a doer of the word, not just a hearer only. And in this point, he's coming back. So you have this long stretch of scripture where he talks about resisting the devil, submitting to God, humbling yourself. And then he comes back and says again, if you are sitting in judgment and you're slandering somebody, then you're sitting as a judge and it's not your place. And so that's what verse 11 says. Um, so let's, let's go back. Let me skip through a few of these because we don't need to recover these. Um, but I left it all on here in case I wanted to. Verse 11, brothers and sisters, do not slander one another. Now, here's what's interesting about this word used for slander. Um, uh, different translations have different things. Um, verse, verse 11 in the New American Standard says, do not speak against one another, brethren. Um, several translations you handle this differently. Don't judge one another is another way you'll, you'll see this word. So this word contains judging or, or speaking evil of somebody. Now, in reading some ancient not ancient, they're ancient to me, but reading some old documents um, from different generals and things, slander was a big deal. And, and here's, here's what is meant by slander. Here's what's meant by this judgment. It means to, to bring somebody else down. You know, we talk about all the time, blowing, blowing somebody else's candle out doesn't make yours burn any brighter. Well, actually, if we cost, cast a shadow of doubt, so slander involves usually three parties. There's the one party that's slandering, the second party who's listening, and the third party who's actually being slandered. Now, what, what the person who's doing the slandering is trying to do is to cast doubt to the person they're speaking to about this other person. So, so they're running them down the ground to, to cause them to maybe be on their side or, or to reverse their thinking. Actually, as a matter of fact, what I have witnessed in the last few elections of my life, no matter what kind of election it was, was the airwaves are full of slander. And it's become normal and it's normalized, and so people don't think anything about it. But, you know, I would much rather hear a candidate say what they bring to the table rather than how evil this other candidate is. And so we, we have this constant barrage of slander in the world. Matter of fact, we, we adjust to that. We, we hear it all the time. And, and see, James says, don't do that. Don't participate in it. Don't be the speaker. Don't be the receiver. One of the 
quotes that I, I liked several years ago, and, and it fit my life at the time, and it really gave me a different way to look at things, is, is I'm not so worried about the person who's talking bad about me to you. I'm more worried about why you listened. Why were you a willing vessel to receive? Don't tell me what kind of friend you are. And come to me and say, you're never going to believe what sister or brother so-and-so said about you. And, and, and all the, my, my question is, is, why do they feel comfortable sharing it with you? If you're my friend or if you have my back. And a lot of times you'll find out people don't really have your back. They'll, they'll let a situation unfold. But they, they, won't, they won't stand up for you. They won't, they won't defend you. They won't, and, and several of the ancient documents I, I've read, one guy was, was actually trying to tell this king. And I can't remember all the names because I read so many of them. They're all, they're all either... Um, Greek or uh, Persian or, you know, I, I'm not good with those names. But anyway, uh, somebody had come and said, you, you don't worry about the Grecians, they, they can't fight. You need to go ahead and, and just go ahead on over there and you can take over, they can't fight. Well, that's not true at all. I mean, you start thinking about the Athenians and you start thinking about their, their capability for war, but he began to slander them. And then the, the actual general he was talking to said, don't, don't bring me this kind of report because, I, first of all, I don't believe it's true. Don't, don't try to sell them down the road that way. You see, people were more resistant in times past to slander than we are today. It's become a normal practice. It's a normal practice in churches. You, you, you hear uh, people will sit down. I've had people sit down and say, I'm, I'm worried about so-and-so um, because they say this and they say this and they say that, but then they do this. And, and, you know, one of the things that people like to say to me all the time is, you know, love the sinner but hate the sin. And see, you've heard me say, and I will repeat until the Lord instructs me otherwise is that's not what the bible teaches the bible teaches to love the sinner hate your own sin we're not to sit in judgment of somebody else and so here we are practicing the royal law which is a law of liberty and at the same time we're still trying to cram the old testament law in on people's lives how many times do people go to leviticus and they'll quote a section of scripture there but then they'll leave the rest of it out like cutting the corners of your beards or or when you harvest your harvest your crop you harvest all of it you don't leave the corners you don't leave enough for somebody to come behind and glean matter of fact if somebody was to come today and glean it's not our culture but back in that day they would drop what's called handfuls of purpose and that would be for the people who would come behind who who had no money no way to eat and they would leave gleanings in the field and we know that if you'll study the story of ruth you'll see that that's what they were doing they, they had moved back into the land of israel and they were picking up the gleanings in in the field and they were leaving more they were leaving more there for them because, you know, they kind of, you know, they kind of liked her. They thought she was cute and all. And, um, you know, they provided more for, for Naomi and Ruth that way. That was the way the Lord taught them to do it. So people will come and, and, and want to quote a, a certain section out of Leviticus, out of the Levitical law, but not quote all of it. Not hold to the whole thing and yet want to hold somebody's feet to the fire for something else. Well, that's completely contrary to the New Testament teaching. That's not our place. That's why Jesus said, judge not lest to be judged. He's referring to judging according to salvation because who could know anybody else's heart? Do I have any way of knowing anybody in this room as a born-again believer? I can't know that, can I? But I tell you what I can know is I can know that Jesus told me to love everybody, to love my neighbor. Now, he didn't say love your neighbor if they have the same religion as you. He didn't say love your neighbor if they have the same um, culture as you, same ethnicity of you. He said love your neighbor neighbor and then he used a story of the Samaritan who was the only neighbor in the event the Levite and the priest both got on the other side of the road so the religious people got on the other side of the road to avoid because they, they didn't want to get contaminated you see you see that's how the law had led people to think and so James is reiterating exactly what Jesus taught and and so he says it here he says do not slander one another this is the same sin that Satan's name comes from. He's known as the slanderer. It's a, it's, it has the same derivative in meaning. Even though it's two different Greek words, it has the same meaning is, is to talk evil about. Now think about what purpose do we have ever in saying anything negative about somebody else. Now, if I'm going to hire a contractor and you know they've got a bad background, and you say, uh, Pastor Russ, you may, want, may not want to hire that guy. He's got a bad habit of not finishing a job. That's not slandering. That's just a representation of something that actually happened to them. Now, if you say, well, I've heard, but I don't know personally. See, it's a whole different thing when, when we're picking out things about people to try to keep somebody down. That's what James is talking about. This, this, these Jewish believers had got out into the world, 
and, and they had been scattered from their home. They had a, 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 a superior, a inferior, inferiority complex. They were in the wrong place doing the wrong things. They'd lost all their stuff, and then they were negative, and they had let that bitter root get involved. And James says, listen, don't do that. So it's interesting to me that earlier, he says, resist the slanderer. Resist the Satan. And then just a couple verses later, he talks about don't practice the activity of Satan. Don't get involved in the same things that he does. And so if you go back and you do a study on Satan in the Old Testament, now one of the problems that, that we really don't understand Satan because we have the Middle Ages and it messed everything up. That's why we don't have a, a correct understanding of hell because we have Dante's Inferno and the seven levels of hell. And we have all this, this hype and, and all these things. And, and we, we get caught up in the modern day pipeline of teachings. That's why Several years ago when Harry Potter came out, everybody was just running around and just absolutely freaking out because you got this dude just wearing a robe and he's got a wand and he's saying these enchantments and they're saying the Bible says stay away from witchcraft. But the problem is nowhere in the Old Testament did witchcraft ever look like that. As a matter of fact, the words that are translated witchcraft in the old King James sell it short because they'll take a word for necromancy, which means talking to the dead, and they'll translate it witchcraft. They'll take a word that means pharmaceuticals and they'll translate it as witchcraft. So, so there were a lot of things that were just thrown in. Well, then you had the Salem witch trials. And what a mess that was. Because you would take somebody who's a midwife or good with herbs, and the church would judge them as a witch, and then it would kill them. Burn them at the stake or drown them. And, and it was just somebody who just practiced their life differently. See, that's what James was getting at. Just because somebody's different from you. Anybody ever heard of tribalism? Aren't we tribal? I mean, aren't all of us tribal? We, we like to be with people that are like us. We like to be with people who think like us and practice their religion like us. We like to be around people that, that understand these churchy words that we use. And it just makes us comfortable. But the truth of the matter is, a lot of times tribalism creates a separation that should have never been there. We, we push people away without ever being willing to talk to them in what their belief system is. As a matter of fact, I've talked to people who, who come from a different way of practicing their their christianity than i do just to talk to other people so we got to stay away from them they're a cult he said well why are they a cult well because they don't believe things right and see then we start getting into a bad practice and, and next thing you know we've fallen into the trap of slander and that's what james is speaking about here a lot of times we we think it's it's not slander but a lot of times it is and james warns against it he said anyone who speaks against a brother or sister judge them or judges them, speaks against the law, and judges it. When we speak against a brother or sister, we speak against their liberty. We speak against, you know, Jesus gave us freedom. He came to set us free, right? To set the captives free. He came to abolish the law. James is not talking about that law. He's talking about the, the royal law that he's going to talk about in the very next chapter. He's talking about the liberty and freedom that comes in Christ. So if people don't practice theirs the same way as you, and we begin to draw lines in the sand, we begin to push people away, we begin to separate from them because we have understood them to not be. I've had people come to me my entire life and question the salvation of somebody because they didn't recognize the same things that I recognize or they didn't hold to the inerrancy of Scripture. I've had people come to me and, 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 and tell me, well, you can't listen to no Dr. So-and-so because he doesn't hold to the inerrancy of Scripture. And that's funny because that's, that wouldn't be anything I would consider cardinal. I've had people come to me and say, well, you, this guy can't be saved because he doesn't believe in the virgin birth of, of Christ. Or he can't be a born-again believer because, yet at the same time, when you ask him, you know, who do you believe? I believe in Jesus Christ. I, I believe in and that, that he came, that he did these things he was supposed to do, that he was sinless, he died, and he rose again the third day. And everything, they, everything that the gospel tells us is true, they believe is true, but because they do some little something different. A snake handling comes to mind. Anybody ever know a snake handler? I'm not going to hang out. I'm all for their right to do that, but I'm not going to stick around. <laughs> I, just, I got this thing about rattlers and copperheads and those kind of things. I'm not going to drink arsenic, but if somebody wants to do that, then they're going to, if I, I've sat down and I've spoke, I've spoke with snake handlers. When I was in Bell County, Kentucky, going to school at Clear Creek, I knew a guy who was a snake handler. I knew guys that were holiness preachers. I, I, knew, I knew a guy that didn't believe I was a born-again believer because of this ring on my hand. Because we're not supposed to adorn ourselves. 
And because I wore a gold ring on my hand, I couldn't be a believer. I have friends that are Seventh-day Adventists that don't think I'm a born-again believer because I have the mark of the beast on me. The mark of the beast to these people is that I come to church on Sundays. They believe they ought to come to church on Saturdays. You know where they get that? Same word we got laying in front of us. And see, that's the thing is we begin to pull it out the way we understand it and we completely start to disregard the way other people understand it. And James says, don't do that. When you speak against them, you've set yourself up as a judge. Now, we're supposed to be practicing the law in our own life, not sitting as a lawmaker. And that's what James is getting at here. He's, and that's what he's saying here. Anyone who speaks against a brother or sister judges them, speaks against the law and judges it. You have set yourself up in the place of God. Not only do you understand the law, but you get to enforce the law. And, and he, he never wrote anything to me though, so that I can control you. He wrote to me so that I would seek him and walk after him and have a closer walk with him. And I find the closer I walk with him, the less I can take notice of what's going on in your life. As a matter of fact, there are some principles, I think, that go in to people who are slanders, people that have a negative attitude towards everybody else. And, and, and a lot of times it goes back to the way they were raised. Maybe, maybe they had a bad childhood or, or they were under some sort of fair cycle like teaching where, where, where everything was, was just hammered into them and, and, and this is the truth and it's the only truth. Um, a good example, I don't know how many of you in here are theologians, but, but you know, dispensationalism as an end time way of looking at things is relatively new. Yet when I grew up, everybody I knew practiced dispensationalism and they had it all figured out exactly when Christ is going to come back and how he's going to do this and how he's going to do that. And if you didn't believe that, you were a heretic. Now we throw that word heretic around, but that's slander. As a matter of fact, one of my professors in Bible college was what's called amillennial. He didn't believe that the Bible taught a literal thousand year reign. Well, the first time I heard that, I said, well, he's a heretic. He's going to go to hell. Because that's the way I had understood things. But then when I began to talk with him and understood where he was coming from and, and how he handled the same exact passages and how his love for the Savior made him handle it differently, I, I quit using the word heretic. And I, and I start using the word that, that you know, we practice or we keep house differently or, or we interpret. But he had the same love for Scripture that I had. The same love for Jesus that I had. And yet he approached it differently he came from a different point of view and I've run into that in a lot of churches I'm in so it we need to learn not to set ourselves up as judge we're not here to judge anybody are we as a matter of fact if we would remember from where we were raised from what well, the Bible says if you're guilty of one part of the law you're guilty of how much of it and how much have we been forgiven we've been forgiven for all of it that means that even the mistakes that I make today that I made yesterday or I'm going to make tomorrow are forgiven. See, when Jesus died on the cross, I hadn't committed any sins yet, right? Yet he still died for me. And if he died for me and he covered my sin debt, he even covered the sin debt that I don't know about. He covered the things that I'm going to fail at that I didn't know it was a failure. How many times are we raised, and one of the starkest revelations that I had in my life, going from an independent fundamental Baptist to a Southern Baptist church, was the slander. Uh, to hear the pastor chewed up by the deacons on a Sunday afternoon because he didn't present the passage like they thought he should have done or, well, you know, he's got this in his office or he just applied for, for a new, new, new this or a new that. Or he's, and there's all this constant talking. And you know what we do? We get caught up in that. We, we, we begin to look up to people and they're talking bad about somebody. Maybe it's the president. Maybe it's a congressman. Maybe it's the pastor. Maybe it's the deacons. Maybe it's the pastor's wives. And and, and these people that we look up to practice slander, we begin to think, well, maybe that's okay. And so what we need to be aware of is make sure that we don't have anything in our life that looks like, sounds like slander. Um, you're, our kids are listening, right? The, and, and young believers are watching. And the way we conduct ourselves, they're going to deem it as the correct way to carry ourselves. So, so these people that James is writing to had gotten caught up in slander the, the degradation of somebody else because you disagree with them or you don't like the way they do it or you don't like the way they handle it and so James is saying listen don't do that that is something that's not allowed and so he tells us in here that it's something that that God won't bless the assumption is that the law was wrong or not thorough enough so when we judge somebody else 
and we set ourselves up as judge, the, well, the assumption is, is they don't have the liberty under the law of Christ to do that, or that the law was not good enough because they shouldn't be doing that even though the law may not speak to it. And see, that's, that's one of the problems is we, we create, just like the ancient Jews did, we create fence laws. You remember, um, y'all remember Hell's Box Office? HBO? I can remember when, when, when cable, cable came to Georgetown before it did Lexington. I did, could never understood that. I was so excited, and we didn't get it for years. But Georgetown had cable, and then they had, you know, the little cable box. And then on that cable box, you could get a paid, or you could get a paid channel. And on that paid channel, you could get HBO movies. Well, HBO movies have all kind of things in them. And so it was okay in, in the, in the mid-'70s to judge people that had HBO in their house. You say, well, I would never do that. I'll do you one better. It was okay to judge people that smoked cigarettes. Well, that kind of caught on, didn't it? Now, now all of society wants to judge you if you smoke a cigarette. Uh, it's because of the people that smoke a cigarette that the whole rest of the world is, is sick. And, and, and if somebody wants to smoke, as long as they're not blowing the smoke in my face, that's a whole other matter. I can remember going out to eat in a northern Kentucky city not long ago and sat down in a restaurant, and it had been years since I sat down in a restaurant where anybody was smoking. And somebody right on the other side of a flower lit up. And I'm like, somebody's smoking in here. Isn't anybody going to do anything? Nobody was saying a word. Well, come to find out, it was, you're still allowed to smoke in restaurants in Maysville, Kentucky. And I was just blown away by that because tobacco has become the bane of the world. I mean, you can kill a baby the moment it's born, but you can't smoke. And I never could figure that out. How does that work? I'm coughing because he's smoking, and, and that's a big sin. But I could, my, my wife could, could, could have an abortion at any point she wants, it, and everybody just looks the other way. See, I, these things are hard to juggle, aren't they? So like Joshua says, as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. We, we talk about what we believe and, and, and the way we're going to practice it, but that doesn't mean that everybody around us has to practice. But I can remember, you had to be careful. You couldn't let your friends go out with kids. You couldn't let your kids go out with friends' kids who watch Harry Potter because they may influence them. That was the big thing. So we, we get on these bandwagons, and, and it becomes easy to judge. And then I had a guy that actually, and then I, I said, you know what? I'm not going to be against Harry Potter. I'm going to read them. Well, I read them and fell in love with them. I thought they were, they were a great read. Well, there was a guy that actually quit coming to my church because somebody told him that I and my family would go to the release of a Harry Potter movie at midnight dressed like the characters. And so he quit coming to my church. Now, I would do that. But we didn't. We didn't do that. So anybody else in here been the victim of slander? You see why James is talking about this? Because what this does is it takes our focus off of Christ and the liberty that's in Christ. Do I have the liberty to go to a Harry Potter movie? Sure I do. Is God going to send me to hell because I watched a Harry Potter movie? No. But what do we do? We begin to equate things and then we tribalize and we pull back and we isolate people. And then we diminish them so that nobody will listen to them. Just like most of the politics that's gone on the last six months, I would say the last four years actually. Constant politics and constant politics and constant slander until we're just we're fed a diet of slander. If you turn on the news, I don't care which one you turn on, they're slandering somebody else. And, and we, we have this constant diet of and James says, do not do that. So what do we do? What, what does this mean to us as believers? Well, first of all, don't slander. But secondly, recognize it. Now, here's the other thing. If somebody is slandering somebody else and you go out and start repeating the fact that they're slandering somebody, now you're involved. The best thing to do is just walk away from it. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words can never hurt me, right? That's not true at all, is it? I'd rather you throw sticks and stones. I have been accused of things I didn't do. I have been slandered. I have, I've been gossiped about. These things hurt me way more than a lot of things that the, the evangelical right is all up in arms about or the evangelical left, whatever they're all up in arms about. It's funny how we want to polarize and we want to elevate our platform, but our platform, our platform should always be Jesus Christ and him crucified. Amen. And if we'll stay there, Jesus Christ and him crucified. Paul says, I don't know anything when I'm around you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Now, what did Paul know? 
He was probably one of the most brilliant men that's ever lived and written down anything in history. I mean, unbelievably talented, unbelievably gifted, unbelievably spiritually filled. What a a phenom Paul was. But then Paul said, listen, I keep myself under control lest I become a castaway. Think about that. Even Paul, 30-some years into his ministry, was still worried about God putting him on a shelf saying, I can't use you anymore. And so he kept himself in check. So what do we do about when it comes to slander? We keep ourselves in check. I can't keep anybody else in check. The only person I can worry about in any situation is me. The only person I can change in any situation is me. Now, when I'm around toxic people, the only element I can remove from that is myself. I don't feed it. I don't like people to come to me and start a gossip session. I'm not a confrontational person. I have more zeal about me when I'm teaching something than I ever do in a private conversation. But I don't like gossip. And I, I don't like people to come to me and, and, and begin to give me gossip on somebody. I just, you know, and, you know, I find out that if you don't receive it, they'll soon quit coming to you. But it's hard for somebody who's a people pleaser, for who wants to, you know, make friends and influence people. It, it's hard to say, you know, I don't practice gossip. Because as soon as you say that, what have you done? You've called them a gossip in their mind. But if they're coming to you and they're bearing tails and they're trying to tear somebody down, it's exactly what they're doing. Now, if they come to you and they say 911 plane flew into the building and it crashed to the ground, that's not gossip. That's history, isn't it? And so we have to understand that slander is the degradation of somebody else's character. In any way, any form, if it's the degradation of somebody else's character, my job as a Christian is stay away from it. It's hard to tear people down when you're praying for them, isn't it? I mean, if you're pray- I mean, if you're agonizing in prayer over somebody and the state of their soul, you're not going to spend time tearing them down, are you? What a waste to pray for them one minute and attack them at the next minute. So, so I think that's it's a good reflector of how much we honestly love. With the love of Christ in us, there's no room for slander. There's no room for character assassination. There's no room for pushing my party and my belief system above somebody else's. Because when I blow out somebody else's candle, mine doesn't get brighter. I'm actually dimming my light. And nobody wants to hear that, especially from a minister. He said, but you're not keeping it, but sitting in judgment of it. We're not a doer, but a judge. Remember earlier, he said, be a doer. Be a doer. Be a doer. Don't be a judge. So he's coming back full circle. So this whole pericope, this whole section of scriptures had to do with being a doer of the word he's been giving us illustrations of what it means to be a doer of the word and if we're going to be a doer of the law the law was not written to me for me to correct Harold the law was written so that I could then correct my life and my walk it's God's job to take care of Harold amen and Charlotte that's why God gave Harold the law and Charlotte To help him stay where he needs to stay. He doesn't need me, does he? He's got plenty. He's got you, right. (laughs) Exactly right. And Charlotte, she probably doesn't need much correction from Harold, does she? (laughs) So we're to be doers. We're we're supposed to practice the royal law. Do what? I've gone to meddling. I've quit preaching and gone to meddling. That's exactly right. I, I, I was scanning for a face that I could pick on that looked like their eyes were still smiling. And so I thought, you know, I, you know me and Harold are pretty tight, so I, 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 can, I can probably, we can volley back and forth and, and it'd be safe. Um, and then whenever I'm lifting Charlotte up and tearing Harold down, that's probably a pretty good thing. And yeah. <laughs> now, the flip-flop of that would not have gone well for me at all. <laughs> not at all. Amen? It would not have gone well. Yeah, you would have had, yeah, see, I would have been ganged up on by the women in the room, and I understand that. I wasn't born yesterday. So, see, slander is accepted today in all its forms. We, we degrade the person by calling attention to their perceived shortcomings. We decide what is acceptable and what is not, therefore, acting as a lawgiver, and the Bible calls that sin. Again, remember what Jesus said in Matthew 7, 1. Judge not, lest they be judged. And that, that directly ties into ju- sitting as a person in judgment. Now, we're, we're to be fruit inspectors. A lot of people, you'll hear that, don't judge, don't judge, don't But you judge. You judge tonight whether you're going to come to church or not, didn't you? 
You made an evaluation of what chair you want to sit in. So, so making a judgment call is not what this is talking about. It's talking about judging in a way that degrades. It's talking about judgment in a way that involves slander or the character assassination of somebody else. And so this is what's being taught here. But if you're having a conversation with somebody and they come to you and say, you know, I, I don't mind. I don't even want to pick a sin because that gets me in trouble every single time. But somebody comes to me and they say, you know, I, I, I don't think that this is really wrong for me to practice that. And I say, well, my understanding of Scripture says this, so therefore I don't. You see how you handle that? But if I come back and say, well, you're just a sinner then, I doubt you're saved. It's going to have a whole other effect other than saying, as for me in my house, in my understanding of Scripture, this is how I walk. I can't change anybody else. I struggle changing me, amen? If it wasn't for the, the, the grace of Christ and the blood of Jesus... I would, be, I would be a lost sinner without any hope whatsoever. But grace. But grace. And so that's, that's kind of what, you know, when, 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 as the Bible says, our speech is salted with grace, this is kind of what, this, is, this plays right into the same thing. People should feel bettered by being in our presence. When they, when they leave our presence, they should say, you know, I don't know what he's got, but I like it. I've, I've never heard him say anything bad about anybody else. Now, no, nobody can say that about me because that is not true. But when I read scripture like this in James, it's convicting to me. And as I mow through the teaching, we have to deal with what the Bible says and then we move on to the next thing. And so slander is something that's easy to fall into, but it should not be a part of a Christian's life. So, what, so we can ask ourselves, so what's the Lord showing me in this text? What, what is it I can gain from this text? Well, there's a couple of things. If you are a slandering person, stop. If you are a person who listens to slander, stop. Focus on the positive. Focus on the fact that the person that you're hearing run down, Jesus Christ loved so much, he died for them. Who are you to not love them equally as a forgiven child? Well, that's a tough one. And there are other things that, that keep me from nearness to God. And here it is. He just said, humble yourself and the Lord will lift you up. There's no place for humility and slander in the same person. You're not being humble at all when you're judging somebody else. When, when you're slandering, when you're, when you're defaming somebody else, this, this, that, there's no humility in it because you believe that you're better than that. And when you think that you're better than that, this person, so you get to pick on what they're doing by your own perception that's wrong, you're not their judge. You're not their judge. You don't get to evaluate. Remember what Paul said? You remember all the argument in Corinth? In Corinth? Should you eat meat? Should you not eat meat? You know, the vegetarians were saying, you know, if you're godly, you're going to be a vegetarian. Then they had this whole other group of people that said, hey, you, cannot, you can't eat that meat because it was just bought down here to the temple to Apollo. And you can't eat that meat because it was given to idols. And what did Paul say? Listen, Paul said, listen, I love the meat they sell down at, at, the, at Apollos' warehouse. But I will not eat it if it offends a brother. So he was changing his freedom. He was taking his freedom and not acting upon it. He could eat the meat. He knew it wasn't nothing. It wasn't nothing to he, these are just These are just demons. No, no big deal at all. But if your conscience, if your conscience pricks you, stay away from it. So when you go to buy meat at the counter that's been offered to Apollos, and maybe you're an ex-worshipper of Apollos or Apollo, you may want to say, I, I'm not going, this is part of my old life, and, it, and it's a stumbling block for me. I'm going to stay away from this. That's what Paul said. He said, but if you've got a weaker brother around you, a weaker sister around you who's going to be affected by your actions, don't let your liberty be evil spoken of. In other words, don't get yourself in a place where people begin to slander you and they can't see Jesus' light because all they can see is that you gorge yourself on meat that was offered to an idol. And if that's all they see, they're missing Jesus in your life. It's better to walk away from those things, even though you have liberty to practice those things, it's better to not do that before you become an offense to younger Christians or weaker Christians. And there's where the struggle comes in. So what are the things that are keeping me from nearness of God? So that's my teaching for tonight. Um, God bless you. Have a great week.